Well, hello, lovely listeners. Um, today, I have the great honour of speaking with Bethan Jepson. Uh, Bethan um, makes me wonder what the hell I've been doing with my life, genuinely. Um, she reminds me of the younger me, um, for sure. And um, she's an award-winning entrepreneur, mentor, and she has her own podcast as well. And she's launched and grown multiple six-figure companies in the past five years, from legal recruitment to coaching services to health products, and now she's in engineering. I'm intrigued to know how on earth she's done all of that. Um, she's also a partner in UK Business Capital Partners, where they acquire partner or invest in businesses. And it's about helping them to fulfill their growth potential or give them, give the original founders, sorry, the resources to thrive, step back or move on, you know. Um, so <clears throat> there is loads more I could say. Um, there really is. Um, oh, her podcast is called Millionaire Secrets, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, which I'm quite intrigued to listen to as well. So there's loads more I can say, but Bethan can say it herself. So over to you, Bethan. Welcome, welcome. I'm so pleased to have you here. And um, yeah, hello. Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, yeah, it's always nice to be asked to do these things. So yeah, I'm hopefully I can share some wisdom and yeah, yeah we'll see what happens. <laughs> Bethan is from uh, sunny Manchester, although it's not sunny today. And um, which is, you know, she's in the in England, the same as me. And um, yeah, I mean, Bethan really, I, I love to have conversations with people to understand what, how, they got to where they've got to, um, you know, a little bit of your backstory in terms of when you were younger and, and how all this came about and any sort of, you know, pivotal moments or moments of, you know, like a eureka moment or whatever that came to you that, that made all of this happen. So over to you. <laughs> um, well, I think the name of your podcast is really interesting to me, like the never settle kind of element of it. Yeah. Um, and when you talk about kind of childhood epiphanies or whatever or like pivotal moments that happened to me in my childhood like that that was what like the pivotal moments of my childhood led to that epiphany of I will never settle because just to share a bit of insight like so I grew up um <clears throat> not in a kind of traditional like I guess family in a sense because we uh, fostered children so at any given time um there'd be me and my real brother and then at any given time there'd be like one to three additional <laughs> children oh. running around the place um, <laughs> how, and was it was that? Like, how was that hard <laughs> um really hard because you don't as a child have the wisdom and life experience to process what's mm. really happening mm. so it becomes very confusing like I have memories where I don't even know if they're real because I wasn't mature enough to understand what was going on yeah and because my parents who were adults process things as adults <laughs> you know they could put perspective on things they could be empathetic you know, they could understand that, you know, a child who's being violent, they're being violent, not because they're a bad person, but because their parents were violent and they're just kind of passing on what they've been taught. Whereas to me, a child who's violent, like I was like, they're the devil. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, they are evil. <laughs> and I didn't have, so like I would get really angry or sad or confused and my parents wouldn't react at all. Mm -hmm. So I would look at situations as like the end of the world. And, but to my parents, it was nothing. And so that makes you question how you see the world. Because mm. if the people around you who influence you the most, i.e. your parents and even my teachers at school, if they don't react to some of the things that I think are the, the worst things ever, <laughs> like then, what's really going on <laughs> so yeah so so that really I mean big lessons around perspective there which now as an adult and business owner who deals with people like that's my main role in the business like the business I do now is looking after people <laughs> 
so for me to now I can take that and be like well you know everyone's got a different perspective everyone sees, sees the world differently so no one's right or wrong nothing's true or false nothing's black or white like that's really helpful now <laughs> but so that, must, that must have felt like you weren't being acknowledged you know it's like these kids have come in that aren't even part of our family and and they're getting away with murder almost and and um and I'm you know and and mom's not, and dad's not going there 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 darling you know you're the best and all the rest of it which is probably what you wanted to hear at the time yeah um but that that's that's really interesting because I can see already where the motivation has come from for mm. what you become yeah and I have no doubt that it still impacts me every single day because of that reason like I think a big part of what drives me is I want to be seen yeah want, and, and, which is hilarious because I'm an introvert so like I'll, I'll be like I'll get myself into these like opportunities where I'm on stage or even like doing this podcast for instance yeah but then I'm like I'm here and I'm like oh <laughs> <Okay. laughs> what am I doing <laughs> I'm like do I really you know so it, it yeah which is interesting but obviously you know you learn a lot from doing these things and uh, I actually really enjoy public speaking now. It was really difficult at first, but I actually really enjoy it now. Um, and also as well, because my dad is actually one of my business partners. Right. Um, and I've like the, that, the, one of the businesses you mentioned in the introduction, the legal recruitment company, that was me and my dad again together. Mm. So like I, if I'm not careful and if I, um, yeah, if I don't turn up to work as my best self, let's say, um, I can revert to that me as a child who just wants daddy's approval. <laughs> Daddy, see me, um, which is challenging because as a, especially in some of the situations I now get myself into where I'm speaking to investors or I'm speaking to the owner of a business and I'm saying, you know, I want to buy your business, I want to take your business, like, I want to, you know, preserve your legacy, but then, you know, take it to the next level. Like, I have to be my most adult version of myself <laughs> to feel good and feel confident to do those things. So it can be challenging if I've not turned up in the right mindset, and especially if my dad's in that meeting with me. <laughs> yeah. I can quite easily be like, oh, I'll let daddy do all the talking. <laughs> You know, I'm the child and dad's dad's the adult. So, you know, I'm I'm being really vulnerable here, but that is actually the truth of like yeah. how it all uh, how it all impacts me. But um thank you so much for that. No, no, at all. And and I guess if I, yeah, I guess if I come back to that kind of never settle message, like that was kind of I guess one of the benefits of my parents doing that, you know, the fostering and yeah. growing up in a traditional you know, safe and secure home environment is that I, I've seen the worst of the world. Like I've seen families in poverty. I've seen children in poverty. I've seen like the results of that. And I've also seen the results of like people who are well paid and kind of wealthy because that's what we were. You know, my dad was a lawyer at the time and you you do actually get well paid if you're a foster carer, yeah. especially if you're in the type of foster caring that we did because we were ours were like the kind of special circumstances that no one else would no one else would take basically so we were living this middle class life but my mum having this job which is like 24 7 of fostering like she was well paid but she was very stressed all the time never could switch off um so it, well, my dad is a lawyer as well he I guess he was the same like he would go to work in the day have a stressful day come back have a stressful evening <laughs> like I've seen both sides of kind of not not living a life that is based around happiness you know and I just knew from an early age there's nothing nothing is worth that like I'm very driven professionally but I would never sacrifice my happiness like my relationships you know my health I will never never do that <laughs> because I've seen that do, do you know what drove your mum to want to do? Uh, presumably, it's your mum that drove that. If your dad had already got, a, you know, a successful business being a lawyer, and obviously, you know, he was earning a bubble too. Uh, wasn't like you were on the breadline or anything. What do you know? What drove your mum to want to do the foster care? Um, I think a good part of her was doing it for us, 
um, as well as for herself, like her, her professional background has always been looking after children. So she was like a, a, a nanny, uh, like when she was uh, in her early 20s. And then she ran a nursery when my brother was really young, my older brother. Um, and then we moved to Manchester um, for my dad's job. We were living um, in Staffordshire in the countryside up until then. And she start, She got a job at a, um, I guess you'd call it like a mental health facility where it was like um, people who'd committed crimes, but they weren't in sound mind. So rather than go to prison, you go to this mental health facility. She got a job there um, for about a year when we first moved to Manchester. I think because she always, she wants to look after people. It's her purpose to look after people. But I remember me and my brother made it very difficult for her because obviously when you have two working parents, you have to go into after school club, you have to go to these like summer camps. And me and my brother made it clear that we hated those things. <laughs> like we're both introverted. We don't like organized fun. We don't like mixing with people we don't know. <laughs> uh, from a social perspective, we both can turn it on for business. He's a very successful CEO himself. Um, but as kids, we just didn't like doing those things. So we basically told, like, we made it obvious that we were not into it. So I think part of her was like, well, at least I can stay at home and be with my kids if I'm doing this. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, um, you know, and that's why I don't now, as an adult, I'm doing quite a bit of work on myself. <laughs> I don't hold any sort of resentment or anger now towards my parents because I can see those things like I know part of the reason she did it was for us so that we didn't have to go to the after school club and we we could just come home and you know we didn't have to go to these horrendous summer camps and <laughs> stuff I'm probably going to put my children through oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, well well she sounds she sounds amazing actually you know she's she's definitely she's amazing but she doesn't know it at all she's like she totally undersells herself and totally undervalues what she's capable of mm. like a lot of women let's be honest um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where it's amazing especially like you said you're an introvert that you've you well it, it's that inner it's that inner thing that's driving you isn't it regardless of whether you're an introvert or not that's that's irrespective because there are a lot of introverts that are very successful in business. Yeah. Um, so, so, so how, sorry. So, so it's a really valuable, um, yeah. I, guess, I don't know what you call it, like natural tendency in some ways, because you crave a deeper relationship more than a superficial, yeah. like, to loads of people. Like you crave that one-to-one, -one, let's get to know each other really well kind of way of building relationships, which is actually like, again, doing what I do where, you know, I'm either, you know, taking on someone's business, which is their baby, or I'm asking for money off somebody to, to which, you know, people hold a lot of, uh, you know, emotional attachment to money and stuff like, they want to trust you, they want to know that you're going to do a good job and you're going to care. And if you don't have that deep relationship with somebody, that's very difficult. Mm. So I, it's a total strength for what I'm doing now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, sorry. So yeah, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, so your mom ended up doing the foster care. You you had your own issues around that, and then did you do uni and everything? Yeah. So um, again, yeah, one of my ways of I guess coping and fulfilling that part of myself to be seen rather than feeling invisible all the time um, was that I did very very well academically and I pushed myself like you know very very far as far as I could probably take that to be honest um even if I was bad at something I would work my like I'd work my ass off to at least get a good grade in it like you know I'd figure out what boxes I needed to tick mm. in order to to pass or not just pass but get an A <laughs> in a in a subject that wasn't like I wasn't naturally good at so um, I spent a lot of time studying, revising. You know, I would, I would literally, when I was revising for my A-levels, um, I would literally go out with my friends to a pub 
on like a Friday night, like, you know, a lot of 17, 18 year olds do. And I would have one drink while all my friends were getting drunk. <laughs> and then I would go home and I would at midnight and I would open up the books again and I would study till two, three in the morning. <laughs> like I was driven. And then, yeah, so I went on to a really good university and then I did a master's as well, another good university. Um, so yeah, did, did the whole academic thing. <laughs> so how did you so was the first business you got into with your dad was it the legal recruitment one yeah um and that was a total accident um so I actually studied environmental science I was really passionate about the environment I still am very passionate about the environment and I wanted to be a a conservation scientist or a pollution scientist or something I don't know something along those lines um but because I hadn't, when I left university, I think because I'd suppressed a lot of the emotions and memories from my childhood, uh, it kind of all kind of exploded when I got out of university and I'd lost that structure, I lost that focus. Because I think when you're going through something terrible, you, you know, I became very good at compartmentalizing and putting my focus on something I knew I could thrive in to just I don't know to just cope I suppose so then when I lost that structure of university and that thing to focus on it all just like yeah I literally had this like personal explosion of like just yeah things I didn't even things that I couldn't even remember before like memories were coming back to me Mm. and like emotions and anger and like frustration and like a deep sadness um just came just came over me when I left university I was probably depressed like if I'd have gone to a doctor I'm sure they would have told me that I was depressed um so I couldn't really function from like a getting a job perspective <laughs> like you know I filled in a few job applications but I couldn't cope with the rejection at all like oh. it broke every time you know you'd get that email that's like oh you, ha- you haven't you haven't made it or whatever it, every time it would break me and I would have to pick myself back up suppress everything again <laughs> and then and go again and I think after like eight eight nine ten rejections which is very normal when you're a graduate yeah um I couldn't do it anymore so my dad you know he had his own business by this point and he said come and just come and do it you know an admin job or you can file some stuff, you can make the tea <laughs> whilst you um, figure out what you want to do. Because um, my parents kind of put their little, I don't know, like uh, denial hat on and was like, oh, she's fine. She just needs time. She just needs, you know, they obviously didn't want to feel like they'd caused me to be, you know, to be this depressed individual. <laughs> but, you know, in reality, that's what a traumatic childhood leads to um so yeah so I kind of went into his business with no expectations of progressing no expectations of being there very long just to make a little bit of money and pass the time basically Mm. um but when I got in there I found that the same thing that drove me in like terms of my passion for the environment from like a problem solving perspective like you know oh there's all this global warming and that, you know pollution problems like you know this the the not just the scientist in me but like the passionate individual in me that cares about solving big problems like that that individual is actually very powerful in a business like the problem solver role <laughs> is game changing for a business the person that has the courage and the audacity <laughs> to take on big problems like yeah it it, as it turns out it can change everything so pretty much from day one I would start noticing things around the office like things that I thought could be done better or things that I thought like people hadn't thought about or I don't know I just started finding problems and then coming up with solutions started off with small things like you know filing things more efficiently and um you know, I would notice um, when people called up, you know, uh, because it was legal recruitment. So, you know, there were people in the business that would call up lawyers and be like, oh, I've got this job, like I've got this potential job. What do you think about it? Blah, 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 blah. 
and I you know I would hear these conversations and I would I guess I would make suggestions on like language tweaks and things they could maybe say that might get them you know I just felt like they weren't treating these people as human beings and well if you said this they might feel a bit more like you care about them and like and I would just start making these suggestions and bit by bit they made a big difference <laughs> let's say um so yeah so I kind of just worked my way up I, you know I went from being like I think I was admin assistant was my first job title and then I think and then I moved into like marketing manager not because I had any experience with marketing but just because it felt like common sense to me to use certain language and um you know I, I, I enjoyed creating things I could create a flyer or a graphic or something that you know looked appealing I don't know I just had a natural tendency for that and I even paid for myself to do some marketing training I never asked the business to like pay for anything for me I always kind of took that on myself as like this is my development so I'm gonna do that so I moved into marketing um noticed like the operations director at the time quit so there was no one doing any sort of people management or finance management so then I started like teaching myself about finance I did this course so then took on the finance and then people you know just I've never really done any training in people but I just seem to be able to understand what makes people tick and what drives people and you know I can just read between the lines if somebody says something like uh I don't know trying to think of an example like um I don't know if someone's like oh I'm you know I'm not I don't really want to do this job or I don't you know I don't feel like it's in my role to do this job like you know I can I can see I can kind of see where resistance is coming from and then I can kind of speak to that person and find something that personally motivates them or something that personally benefits them that then means that they're willing to go above and beyond and I don't know I've just always had this thing of reading between the lines with that so yes I started to look after people within the business make sure that they felt like you know they were developing and you know they were picking up new skills and they were able to try things they wanted to try and so yes yeah, so I kind of then became like operations manager um and then I think once I'd started networking and really getting to know the market and I'd even I accidentally like made a few sales even though I wasn't a salesperson <laughs> I was just meeting people and adding value and saying oh well if you're not happy at this law firm why don't you try that one over there I know somebody there let's hook you up I would do it very informally like I you know ended up placing people of, um making a few sales for the business and yeah by the, by that time my dad and the other directors were like you're running this business you're you're basically doing everything apart from like hardcore recruitment and you even started to do that so <laughs> let's get you general manager and let's just you, you know and um yeah so so eventually then became the general manager and at that time I was kind of setting up my own my very own like first business myself so uh, I don't know maybe like seven eight months later I actually left to then do that but yeah it was a very <laughs> it was a very unexpected evolution um in that first business <laughs> did you get any resistance from the current employees there you know you're the director's <laughs> daughter and with a snapper and all of that sort of stuff yes I got a lot of resistance at the beginning like no one wanted to hang out with me like they would the staff would go and like for drinks after work and no one would invite me even though my um my boyfriend now husband um was in the team as well like that he they would invite him <laughs> and not invite oh, yeah. me <laughs> um and it was only to be honest I don't blame them because you know if 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 I was in that seat and someone came into the business and just started doing what doing what they wanted basically asking for no permission whatsoever because I didn't yeah. I just did whatever I wanted and um, luckily it worked out most of the time <laughs> you know it, it and I think that's basically what had to happen I had to earn their respect mm. by them seeing the results of you know the things that I was doing um and then as I was kind of getting promoted especially when I became the general manager and I was kind of recruiting for our business um you know I was bringing in people then that 
you know, best will in the world. They already saw me then in that role. So it wasn't, you know, so by the end of it, there was only like, I don't know, it was a, it was a small business. Like we had like 12, I think at most we had 14 people, but um, at the time when I was kind of coming through, it was like 12 people. Um, so there's it by the end of, I don't know, the two or three years that I was there, um, there was only like four or five people that had been there from the very beginning of seeing me <laughs> kind of come through. And luckily I'd managed to earn their respect by that point. But yeah, it definitely wasn't easy at the beginning. And I felt like I was, my dad didn't give me any help whatsoever let me add like <laughs> he never was like oh well let, let Bethan speak and let's let's hear what she has to say like no I would always have to interrupt like whatever conversation what was happening to put my two cents in there because no one was going to ask me like literally yeah because no one's going to ask me <laughs> so I had to do it that way so uh, yeah it was tough at the beginning and I did feel like it it's it's not nice when you don't feel like you have a voice and especially yeah. like me as a child that was how I felt all the time so for the first like year I was in that business I, I didn't feel like my depression was lifting at all because I constantly felt like I was invisible you know and that's not easy but for some reason I just kept going I just kept trying because what else can you do <laughs> like you, if I stopped I stopped trying then I would always I would always be depressed I would always be stuck in that place so there was only really one way to go which was forward and it took I say it took a while to break through that I don't know what you call it like I felt like it was a cloud at the time like a cloud of just self-doubt and negativity and beating myself up and all this stuff which I'm sure we're all familiar with um but yeah, I, I just literally kept trying and eventually I broke through. And it's weird because I felt like I went from rock bottom to absolute elation. Like it, it, it wasn't like a slow, oh, I feel okay today. It was literally like, oh my God, I've woken up today and I feel amazing. What the hell's happened? <laughs> so it was weird, but I, yeah, I don't know quite how else to describe it. Mm, well, I mean, just listening to you, a lot of people would you said you know what else was there to do but carry on and get on and a lot of people would put the bed cover over their head um mm -hmm. and you didn't you know you you whatever that is that's inside you um is is amazingly resilient so kudos to you and uh <laughs> and kudos to your dad really because if he'd have shown any favoritism that would have made your life even worse right so <laughs> he was he was it was tough love I suppose um uh, maybe yes um so so what was the the so then you said you started your own business and you left a few months later so what was that so um it was actually a business that came about through networking with the lawyers um that I was meeting for the legal recruitment business so um I'd go to these like, pro like professional services networking events you'd have a lot of lawyers but then you'd also have a lot of other professionals from like I don't know like property accounting marketing you know corporate Manchester basically <laughs> um and this was around the time when the gender pay gap regulation got announced so you know companies that had over 200 employees had to report you know exactly what they were paying their men and women in the same roles so there was a you know there was a lot of hoo-ha around oh my god I've just found out my colleague who is male is getting paid for you know 10 grand more than me or 20 grand more than me or you know, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of frustration, and anger, and kind of just like disempowered conversation around like you know I've worked hard. Yes, I've gone away and had children, but I've come back. It's been really hard to come back, and then you know now I'm five years behind my colleague who I was with. You know, blah blah. You know, there was a lot of hopelessness, and like I've just got to accept this. This is terrible. This this makes me feel like crap but I've just got to accept this and you know and I just I think again it was the problem solver within me I just looked around and was like well I don't think we have to accept this I don't think as women we have to accept that you know we are treated as less than somebody who's not gone away and had children or somebody that's 
doesn't always have to be about the children there's other things that happen in life obviously like bereavements and um just changing career direction so I don't know maybe you're an accountant for 10 years and then you're like oh I don't like this actually I'm going to become a marketing person or whatever um <laughs> you know the, there's all sorts of things that happen in life but um I just felt like if you're somebody that's not had that perfect life of okay so I went you know I graduated from university got a job as a lawyer straight away and just worked my way up and now I'm a partner at 13 oh my god life's amazing um which you know not, that happens like one percent of the time and that person usually doesn't end up thinking oh my god life's amazing <laughs> they usually end up thinking oh my god how did I get here this sucks yeah. um yeah. and yeah and I just felt like especially when it came to career like we should feel like we have more power than you know than what was kind of the like the general feel at the time was like I have no power in terms of my career and I just didn't think that that was a way to live um, again, it comes back to that never settling, I think, <laughs> mindset. Um, so I just wanted, I didn't know how I was going to solve the problem at all. I just wanted people to feel like they have people to talk to. They have a place to go to mastermind and brainstorm and like, oh, you know, oh, I've got a pay review coming up. Like, how do I, how do I pitch my, you know, pay, pay rise pitch? Um I just wanted people to feel like they could have a place to go where they could improve their skills, find out what other people are doing. Like, you know, what did you say? How did, you know, how did you give that feedback or blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I created a, a, a network. I called it an empowerment network um, called high flying women. And it basically, it, 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 all it did was I would hold an event once a month and I would just bring together women from all different uh, kind of professional sectors and we would have conversations around certain topics that, you know, it isn't really, it doesn't feel safe to talk about them in the workplace. So things like, you know, how do I manage conflicts with my manager or how do I ask for a pay rise or how do I develop my confidence? Like, how do I, how do I um, position myself as a leader for this promotion that I want to get? And just these kind of, I guess, career-based questions. Um, but after about, well, let's be honest, it was after like one event, <laughs> I realized that you can't just talk about your career in isolation. Like you can't just have your head down and focus on career and think that everything's going to be dandy. Because like I said before, like life happens and we all have personal lives <laughs> and part of the problem Um with the professional sector at the time. And I think actually most businesses that from what I'm seeing now is that people don't feel like they can be human beings at work. They don't feel like they can be themselves. They don't feel like they can be honest about certain things. Um, and that, you know, everyone's trying to keep up appearances and the, the, there would be this thing in um, especially law firm culture where if you weren't, the last one to leave at night then you would be looked down on as being not committed or not as good a lawyer as somebody else but then if everybody else is trying not to be the last one to leave and you all end up sat there until like 7 p.m <laughs> or 8 p.m or 9 p.m or 10 p.m um and and no one wants to be there and no one's happy about being there um but you're all just sat there like well if I leave first then <laughs> I'm gonna look like the worst person ever so um yeah so <laughs> so it kind of evolved quite quickly over time to be uh to be more of like a personal development um kind of space and and you know how do we build that confidence and courage to actually be ourselves and therefore be our best selves and actually be of more value to the business <laughs> um and, and people just did some amazing things. Like I wasn't making any money out of this business, by the way. I say it was a business. It was a platform to my other businesses, actually. Where, um, where did you find these women? Were you, was it from there? Very proactive. I, LinkedIn was amazing at the time. And actually it was much better for me then than it is now, actually, because the algorithm was great. So you could, I would literally advertise an event once on LinkedIn and it would sell out. 
because the algorithm was very generous and it would put it out to all my connections and stuff. Like nowadays, it's kind of gone down the road of most social media in that you only reach a certain percentage of your followers and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, I would literally like, I would do a mixture of proactive approach. So in the beginning, um, I invited everybody personally. I sent everybody an email, personalized email. It wasn't like a copy and paste thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and to the first event, uh, I invited, I don't know, like 30 people. Um, no, actually it was more than that, it was about 40 people, expecting that as most events, there's a drop off, like you know, usually you get a 50% drop off. But at that first event, everybody came, like the 40 people who registered, 40 people turned up, <laughs> which I was not prepared for, <laughs> did not have enough seats. Um, but yeah, and, and so it was kind of a mixture of like proactive approach of like, I see you, I see what you're doing. I think you're doing amazing things and I'd love to invite you to this community where we're all helping each other become amazing and happier and healthier and more fulfilled and all that good stuff. Um, and then, yeah, and then I would advertise just on social, like just on LinkedIn, really. That was the only social media I was using. And yeah, and we so I made some amazing relationships that I still, you know, I still speak to today. And, you know, it's lovely to see like some of the women who came have had massive career changes. Like they've really gone for things that, you know, from like this, this, this is going to make me happy rather than this is going to, this is what my parents want me to do or this is what society wants me to do like you know it's more like this is what makes me happy and you know I just love that like even to this day people are still reaping the rewards of that network even though I haven't run an event since now since 2019 <laughs> so yeah it, it, it was great to do um and it led to my it led to my coaching business um because some it's funny like when you I always I always say to my um coaching clients now if you want to if you want to earn people's credibility like if you want to earn credibility and earn people's trust the best thing you can do is run an event or <laughs> like even if you don't know anything about the topic that you're hosting even if you get external speakers in which is what I was doing I didn't know anything about asking for a pay rise or <laughs> the best ways to interview because I've never even had a job interview like I have no idea um so yeah so even by bringing in external speakers people started to look to me as an expert in like women's empowerment and women's leadership and and really I, <laughs> I didn't have a bloody clue I was just doing what I thought was the right thing and what made sense to me and um yeah so so with a bit of mentoring from the coach that I was working with I then launched my coaching service which obviously I'd already built trust with all these women I'd already built credibility of all these women and so I you know I had pretty much a full coaching service from day one um I launched a health product business off the back of that again because it kind of made sense like people wanted to be healthier you know they wanted to they wanted solutions to these problems of like how do I be healthy when I'm working when you know my career is the focus or when my family is the focus and um so yeah so I built a six-figure health product business <laughs> just from that network and it was amazing like to because I, I made a difference from day one with those businesses because I'd already built this amazing network which in itself made me no money but led to <laughs> the other things that did so wow yeah. So what, what coaching do you do? Is it business coaching or personal coaching or both? Um, so nowadays it's business coaching. Um, I did leadership coaching. Like that was the first kind of coaching I did. Um, but when I started to get clients who are running their own businesses, I just found I enjoyed that more because I could, I could relate to them more because I was myself, I guess, an entrepreneur. Um, whereas I've never really considered myself a you know, a corporate person or, you know, I've never really fit into that world. I've always been that kind of, you know, I'm, I don't sit, you know, I don't do this whole like two hour hair and makeup routine and wear these slinky corporate outfits and put heels on. Like I literally like roll out of bed, put my hair in a pony, do a five minute makeup job, 
wear what's ever comfortable <laughs> and then and then I go and solve problems <laughs> for, for for a living so yeah so I've never felt at home in the corporate world so sometimes I found it quite difficult to relate to that mindset so when I when I started coaching business owners on you know leadership and empowerment and confidence that just felt more natural for me so I kind of then leaned into that and and then they started asking me questions all about marketing and finance and sales and you know and then I and then I found myself being like this yeah like I guess combination of business mentor slash trainer slash teacher slash coach <laughs> um which I, I I lent into for a, probably from the period of 2019 uh end of 2019 to literally like a few months ago where I've made what I'm doing now which is the buying businesses helping business owners sell their businesses um and really like working in those businesses to grow them like which is now my kind of main focus I still have a couple of business coaching clients who I adore working with um and I I hope to keep that going because you know the, these three people in particular I love I just love hanging out with them as well like as well as like you know doing the whole coaching mentoring thing I, I you know I love spending time with them so um although I don't need to do that I'd still like to do it um but you know if they ever decide to not want to work with me that's fine too <laughs> like I say I, you know it's not necessarily a gap I'm trying to fill anymore but if the right person came along who wanted to learn from me I would you know I would I would do it mm. So how did you get into the whole buying businesses or, you know, giving people exit plans and all of that? How did that come about? Um, again, completely by accident, um, which I think the best businesses start that way. Um, I was I've, I've always had my own coaches and mentors like since since I was coming out of that depression cloud, like I didn't come out of that cloud alone. I had a coach. I didn't know what coaching was when I first invested in a coach. Um, but yeah, you know, going back to that place of like, well, I either go forward or I stay still in this cloud <laughs> um, and I just chose to go forward. So, um, yeah, so I've always had coaches and mentors and in 2018, I started working with a business coach slash mentor, um, who I still, uh, he's, I still work with to this day, actually. Um, and I was... I met up with them in Barcelona, um, as you did pre-COVID. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had this kind of intensive couple of days together. Um, and they kind of travel with their own little business entourage. And I was actually having a conversation with someone in, in the team of my business coach. And we were just doing a bit of masterminding and just kind of chatting about life and business. And they're, they're, a lot, they're kind of a lot older than me. They're in like their 50s. Um, and they've done a lot of things as an entrepreneur themselves. And he literally just said to me, do you know what you'd be great at? Buying businesses. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? I've never even heard of this concept. Like, what do you mean? And he kind of explained it to me. Um, and it, you know, and he said it would make sense. Like you're, you're nurturing these businesses, you're helping these businesses grow. But a lot of kind of entrepreneurs, um, and founders don't want to do that specific business forever. Sometimes they just want to build it to a certain point and then get out. Um, other times there are business owners that have had their businesses their whole lives, but they want to retire. Um, so what are they going to do with their business then? And I was like, oh, but yeah, I hadn't really thought about it like that. Like, what do those people do? Um, and yeah, and he just kind of explained how it could potentially just be my next evolution. Uh, I didn't really think much about it I was like that'd be cool like definitely a definitely a direction to head in but no idea how to get there so I'm just gonna let it sit in the universe and just be like I'll just keep thinking about it every now and again um meanwhile my dad had like carried on with his legal recruitment business while I was off gallivanting doing coaching and health product businesses and <laughs> networking and things um but he was getting to the point of being quite unhappy in that business um, because he didn't really know where it was going. You know, it kind of stopped growing. Um, 
you know, he'd, he'd recovered from the 2008 recession and that had taken a lot out of him. Um, and, you know, and he just kind of ran out of energy with it. So completely independently, without talking to each other, my dad then got um, some coaching from a guy who was buying businesses um, and that was his main income. And he was kind of like teaching my dad about the like the nitty gritty, like, okay, so what do you need to look for in their finances? Like what kind of contracts do you need? Blah, 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 like the actual nitty gritty of it. Um, my dad was kind of getting some training on all, all of that. I had no idea. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't tell me. Um, I'd never told him that somebody had said I'd be good at buying businesses. We'd never had this conversation, but both independently had kind of sort of ended up there. <laughs> um, so actually when the pandemic, actually it was before, uh, it was before the pandemic. I think my dad started on this journey like mid 2019. Um, but when the pandemic hit and he was like, I don't have the, I don't have the energy to take the legal recruitment business through this again. <laughs> I've done one recession. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so he actually sold his shares in that business to his his uh, the direct the one remaining director that was there. Um, and he just started looking for a business to buy. Um, meanwhile, I was struggling with the realities of, you know, the pandemic impacting my coaching business my coaching clients and I was you know trying to keep my head above water with all that <laughs> changing everything I was doing to suit the, the you know, pandemic times and going through like quite a stressful and uh time consuming uh you know re uh, like yeah restructuring changing everything yeah, yeah. <laughs> restructuring yeah um and I was just kind of watching him like go through this process of looking for a business and then he found a business um, and he kind of started, you know, he was going through the process of acquiring this business. Um, I just found myself being way more interested in what he was doing than what I was doing. And I would literally like every time I'd speak to him, which is roughly, I mean, I'm very close to my parents now. So I'd see them at least once a week. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd be like, so what's going on? Like, tell me what's, you know, what's, what, where are you up to? What's the latest? Um, and it just became quite clear to me that I, didn't didn't really see a future for my just being a coach like what am I really going to grow this into like do I do I want to bring other coaches in and train them in my methods and and the answer was no to be honest like I don't want to grow my <laughs> coaching business but I also don't want to keep going the way I am because if I want to take a holiday then I have to get, basically get the buy-in from all my clients I can take a week off <laughs> like it just it wasn't the you know, I talk about the success without sacrifice concept and that's mm. what my coaching brand is built on. And I didn't feel like I was having success without sacrifice. I felt like I was more sacrificing <laughs> at that point. Um, so yeah, so I just sat my dad down and was like, do you want a business partner? And he was like, yes, please. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was, uh, yeah, we, we both are good at different things. Yeah. So, you know, by that point, you know, his his weaknesses were starting to impact and he knew that I was strong at the areas that he was weak in. So, you know, it made sense to him straight away to bring me in. So, yeah, so that was, um, when was that? That was literally back end of 2020. Um, so I've been doing it now for a good year. And this is the engineering business. Yeah. So we, yeah, we, it, again, focusing on engineering was kind of an accident. It just so happened that the first business that he acquired was an engineering business um acquiring a business that has physical assets is really good from a financial point of view because you can raise money easier against a physical asset because you're the best one in the world if you fail then at least the person who's like you that money has that physical physical asset to sell and make get that money back mm -hmm. um so it's quite easy to raise money against an engineering manufacturing business um and and my dad my dad's hilarious he's this type of person that gets really obsessed with something like so he's been obsessed with like baking he's been obsessed with cycling he's been obsessed with um like walking and now he's like in this place where he's obsessed with engineering <laughs> 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 it's hilarious because he's not an engineer by background 
Um, but yeah, so he's kind of, he's just loving learning about the industry. I am too, because I'm a scientist, you know, I'm like, you know, my, my early education and well, my whole education is based around science. So it kind of fulfills that part of me that I've not been able to really lean into. And um, it has a massive impact on the environment. And there's actually environmental engineering businesses out there, which one of which we're currently trying to acquire. So it's very exciting for me to, yeah, to lean into that. Um, we've built an amazing team um, in, within our kind of business buying company um, who I love, love working with. And I really missed that team environment when I was kind of a solopreneur. Mm. Um, so I just, yeah, I'm just really enjoying it. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not without its challenges. It's uh, definitely not stress-free, but it's exciting and I feel like I can see the future with this like as a as, you know as a coach I, I was like I couldn't see where this was going but now I can see how it's going to grow and how it's going to become something really significant how it can make an impact like you know those things are very clear now so it just feels easy to feel motivated like to be motivated like to wake up and be like oh you know today I'm doing this and that's so exciting like can't wait to get to work <laughs> So, yeah. Wow. Amazing. And it must be really cool to work with your dad, especially now you've got to a point in your life where, you know, you, you appreciate what they did and, and all of that. Yeah. Um, he sounds like a cool dude as well. He is. He's a, <laughs> like, he's honestly like one of my best friends. Like I love spending time with him on a social level as well as like business level. And um, it's just nice, like to have someone that knows you so well as well, because again you don't have to like really convince like we'd have to convince each other of anything it's like mm. if he comes to me with an idea about finance I know he's so good with numbers that I 100% trust him mm. so I don't have to like worry about it or ask him any questions about it like I'm just like okay great you do that you know meanwhile if I come to him with an idea about marketing or people he's like I know you've got that I know you know what you're doing so yeah just do it <laughs> like we don't you know it so it saves a lot of time yeah. <laughs> just do what you're good at and no one questions it. <laughs> sounds, yeah, sounds like heaven. Um, well, I mean, yeah, like I said to you uh, before I hit record, what the, what the fuck have I been doing with my life? You know, <laughs> that's pretty much how it feels. Um, but you, you just like you say, you've got this natural aptitude and then, and then, you know, I was really intrigued with that building the network of women um and albeit okay the algorithm was much kinder to you back then which it's not these days but you've managed to maintain you know those relationships and and um and although it gave you nothing to begin with it's given you so much more ever since and mm. that's, that's massively inspirational and it's given me a lot of food for thought so I appreciate oh, that thank you. um so Obviously, you've got this engineering. I also followed you on Instagram this morning um, okay. before, <laughs> while, while I was reading up on you. Yeah. And, um, and and I saw the photo of you and your hubby and there was a comment on there. You've been together half your life. You've been with him since 15. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is, again, why I think another reason why the never settle mentality was with me from such a young age, because he's always been like he's always been everything to me like there's nothing in this world that's more important like to me than than he is he is my, like you know people say oh my other half and they say it quite casually but I literally feel like he is my other half <laughs> like I I am I'm a better person because of him mm. like you know when I was when I was a child and didn't feel like I had anybody like I met him when I was like 12 13 and he was he was a friend first as no one's ready for a boyfriend when they're 12 <laughs> um arguably I wasn't ready for a boyfriend when I was 15 either but um <laughs> 14 um but he was he was always there for me like he was always the one consistent thing that I knew would never let me down and I never had to pretend I was okay I never had to like you know he's seen me He's the only one I felt who saw me like forever <laughs> since I've known him. 
Um, and there's just nothing, you know, I hear business owners and entrepreneurs, especially really successful ones, talk about this whole thing of like, we've got one life, so we might as well, you know, do something really important, create these amazing businesses and blah, 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 which I agree with. But I actually think like, it applies even more to the relationships in our lives. Like we have one life, like why not, why why waste that life not being with the people you love or like not, I don't know, like it just seems to me that our relationships are the most important thing. And, and I will always put my relationship with my husband, my relationship with my family, my relationship with my friends, I'll always put them first than more than career, more than business, more than finance, more than anything, because they are everything, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and it's such a shame, you know, like I know a few people, my partner included, who's, you know, has no relationship with um, his sister at the moment. It's been mm -hmm. like four years and it's crazy. It happens all the time with people and friends and family, you know, they don't speak for 15 years over something so stupid, you know, that nobody wants to back down on it. And you've lost that time and you've lost that, you know, um, time to grow with that person uh, more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you can't have a relationship with those people. Sometimes, you know, you just can't gel for whatever reason. Yeah. But um, it's wonderful that you've got that outlook, especially you know, at such a young age and it's credit to your parents. You know, I know yeah. that as much as, you know, you had a hard time when you were younger, it's it's created who you are today. And, oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm sure you're grateful for that all the time. Um, I wouldn't change it. It's made, like you say, it's made me who I am today. And, you know, when I, I got married in September uh, twenty. 21 yeah so just a few months ago oh congratulations yeah. I didn't realize it was so <laughs> yeah we've been together for like 14 years before we got married <laughs> <laughs> um but like I gave a little wedding speech um because that's who I am yeah. um <laughs> and um when I was talking about my family um like I can like the character traits in myself I can trace back to very specific either events or like things that happened or you know series of events that happened in my childhood and I know exactly why I am the way I am I know exactly where everything comes from and and because of like because of that there's no doubt in my mind that if I'd have had a happy you know normal childhood I don't I don't know what I'd, I don't know who I'd be about I know I wouldn't be me <laughs> who yeah. is you know who's done the things I've done and helped the people I've helped and yeah there's just nothing in me that would want to change anything at yeah. all perfect um Bethan how can people find you if they want to find out more about you um where would they go um so I'm I'm Bethan Jepson on every social media platform <laughs> um, although I say every there's loads of them now so I should say Instagram Facebook LinkedIn they're the three that I kind of really use um there aren't many Beth and Jepsons in the world so I'm quite easy to find <laughs> <laughs> um but my podcast as well Millionaire Secrets um is a good one um I'm interviewing millionaires and successful uh business entrepreneurs on there so it's quite a good one if if anyone listening is yeah. uh, an aspiring entrepreneur or is an entrepreneur um but yeah I'd, I'm happy to talk to anyone or yeah it'd be great to hear from people who've listened to this so yeah please do reach out to me whoever's listening <laughs> perfect and um any parting pearls of wisdom or anything that's coming up for you in terms of anyone that's listening right now that might be inspired by your story or feeling stuck or struggling or maybe they've got a business that they want to um do something with any sort of pearls of wisdom um well, I guess I would say the two things that are really coming up for me are like if you are in that place of feeling stuck or even if you were like me when I left university and they feel like there's this cloud around you that you just can't seem to escape from I think the first thing to do is make a conscious choice that you want to 
um, because, you know, although it can feel quite miserable being in that place, at least you're certain of what's going on. Like it can sometimes be scarier to think about uncertain things like life outside the cloud <laughs> um, because then you've not got any excuses. You've not got any anywhere to hide then if you step outside the cloud, like, you know, you are, people can see you then. And I've, I've certainly felt like that. that. There's a bit of a risk in terms of stepping forward and stepping out of the cloud. So I think the first thing is just, you know, it was, uh, I don't know if you know Stephen Bartlett, but he said something on an interview recently when he was talking about his own journey. And he said, like, he basically had a choice between certain misery or uncertainty. And, you know, for him, he chose uncertainty because certain misery is worse. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I did the same thing. I think I was like, well, if I stay where I am, this is certain misery. And although there's uncertain, at least I know it's not certain misery. Um, so I think the first thing is maybe just make that decision. Like you don't want certain misery um, and whatever misery looks like. It might be a struggling business. It might be struggling family, struggling relationships, whatever it is for you. Um, and then I guess the second part to that is don't be afraid to ask for help. And also don't be afraid to pay for help. I know a lot of people have like financial blocks to getting help because you have to pay something for it. Um, but again, it comes back to that question of like certain misery over uncertainty. <laughs> it's like, would you rather lose money that you're ultimately going to make back? Or would you rather have certain misery? Um, so when I invested in my first life coach, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was investing in. I just knew that, yeah, it was a step away from certain misery. So it was worth it. And it changed my life. Like this life coach changed my life. <laughs> uh, it wasn't me alone that did all these things. She was, she provided the foundation for me to do the things I've done. And I still keep in touch with her because and I still like anyone who like wants, like wants a recommendation for a life coach. I always point them to her because she's amazing. She changed my life. Um, and it was worth every penny. <laughs> so I just say, don't be afraid to ask for help. And also don't be afraid to pay for help. It's worth it. It's always worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, well, Bethan, it's been an absolute joy. It really has. Um, I've been hanging on your every word. It's just, you know, it's like, it's like this magical mystery tour, isn't it? Of where, <laughs> where your life has gone and, um, and the, the, um, the strength and the love that surrounds you from your family and, and friends and obviously husband now um, is, is very obvious. And, um, and it's very obvious of the, the real desire for you just to want to help and to want to improve things, you know, and to be that solution um without any real agenda it's just something it's just any it's just you isn't it so um, <laughs> that's, um that's a breath of fresh air so i really appreciate your time today thank you so much and i know the listeners will have loved this oh mel thank you honestly like even now the inner child within me is like oh my gosh mel sees me for who i really am like and that <laughs> means, it means a lot it really does um so yeah i appreciate you so much for that and thank you for having me on today you're very welcome